Chapter 2 The March Inland On Holy Thursday in the year 1519, we arrived with all the fleet at the port of San Juan de Ulua, and as the pilot Alaminos knew the place well from having come there with Juan de Grijalva, he at once ordered the vessels to drop anchor where they would be safe from the northerly gales. The flagship hoisted her royal standards and pennants, and within half an hour of anchoring, two large canoes came out to us, full of Mexican Indians. Seeing the big ship with the standards flying, they knew that it was there they must go to speak with the captain. So they went direct to the flagship, and, going on board, asked who was the Tatuan, which in their language means the chief. Doña Marina, who understood the language well, pointed him out. Then the Indians paid many marks of respect to Cortez, according to their usage, and bade him welcome, and said that their lord, as servant of the great Montezuma, had sent them to ask what kind of men we were, and of what we were in search, and added that if we were in need of anything for ourselves or the ships, that we should tell them, and they would supply it. Our Cortez thanked them through the two interpreters, Aguilar and Doña Marina, and ordered food and wine to be given them, and some blue beads, and after they had drunk, he told them that we came to see them and to trade with them, and that our arrival in their country should cause them no uneasiness, but be looked on by them as fortunate. The messengers returned on shore well content, and the next day, which was Good Friday, we disembarked with the horses and guns on some sand hills which rise to a considerable height, for there was no level land, nothing but sand dunes, and the artilleryman Mesa placed the guns in position to the best of his judgment. Then we set up an altar where mass was said, and we made huts and shelters for Cortez and the captains, and three hundred of the soldiers brought wood and made huts for themselves, and we placed the horses where they would be safe, and in this way was Good Friday passed. The next day, Saturday, Easter Eve, many Indians arrived sent by a chief who was governor under Montezuma, named Pitalpitoc, whom we afterwards called Ovandio. And they brought axes and dressed wood for the huts of the Captain Cortez and the other ranchos near to it, and covered them with large cloths on account of the strength of the sun, for the heat was very great. And they brought fowls and maize cakes and plums, which were then in season, and I think that they brought some gold jewels, and they presented all these things to Cortez, and said that the next day a governor would come and would bring more food. Cortez thanked them heartily and ordered them to be given certain articles in exchange, with which they went away well content. The next day, Easter Sunday, the governor whom they spoke of arrived. His name was Tendile, a man of affairs, and he brought with him Pitopitok, who was also a man of importance among the natives, and there followed them many Indians with presents of fowls and vegetables. Tendile ordered these people to stand aside on a hillock, and with much humility made three obeisances to Cortez, according to their customs, and then to all the soldiers who were standing around. Cortez bade them welcome through our interpreters, and embraced them, and asked them to wait, as he wished presently to speak to them. Meanwhile, he ordered an altar to be made as well as it could be done in the time, and Fray Bartolome de Melo, who was a fine singer, chanted mass, and Padre Juan Diaz assisted, and the two governors and the other chiefs who were with them looked on. When mass was over, Cortez and some of our captains and the two Indian officers of the great Montezuma dined together. When the tables had been cleared away, Cortez went aside with the two caciques and our two interpreters and explained to them that we were Christians and vassals of the greatest lord on earth who had many great princes as his vassals and servants, and that it was at his orders that we had come to this country, because for many years he had heard rumors about the country and the great prince who ruled it, that he wished to be friends with this prince and to tell him many things in the name of the emperor, which things, when he knew and understood them, would please him greatly. Moreover, he wished to trade with their prince and his Indians in good friendship, and he wanted to know where this prince would wish that they should meet so they might confer together. Tendile replied somewhat proudly and said, You have only just now arrived, and you already asked to speak with our prince. Accept now this present which we give you in his name, and afterwards you will tell me what you think fitting. With that he took out a pataka, which is a sort of chest, many articles of gold beautifully and richly worked, and ordered ten loads of white cloth made of cotton and feathers to be brought, wonderful things to see, 
besides quantities of food. Cortez received it all with smiles in a gracious manner, and gave in return beads of twisted glass and other small beads from Spain, and he begged them to send their towns to ask the people to come and trade with us, as he had brought many beads to exchange for gold, and they replied that they would do as he asked. Cortez then ordered his servants to bring an armchair, richly carved and inlaid with some margaritas, stones with many intricate designs in them, and a string of twisted glass beads packed in cotton scented with musk, and a crimson cap with a golden medal engraved with the figure of St. George on horseback, lance in hand, slaying the dragon, and he told Tendile that he should send the chair to his prince Montezuma, so that he could be seated in it when he, Cortez, came to see and speak with him, and that he should place the cup on his head, and that the stones and all the other things were presents from our lord the king as a sign of his friendship, for he was aware that Montezuma was a great prince, and Cortez asked that a day and a place might be named where he could go to see Montezuma. Tendile received the present, and said that his lord Montezuma was such a great prince that it would please him to know our great king, and that he would carry the present to him at once and bring back a reply. It appears that Tendile brought with him some clever painters, such as they had in Mexico, and ordered them to make pictures true to nature of the face and body of Cortez, and all his captains, and of the soldiers, ships, sails, and horses, and of Doña Marina and Aguilar, even of the two greyhounds, and the cannon and cannonballs, and all of the army we had brought with us, and he carried the pictures to his master. Cortez ordered our gunners to load the Lombards with a great charge of powder, so that they should make a great noise when they were fired off, and he told Pedro de Alvarado that he and all the horsemen should get ready, so that these servants of Montezuma might see them gallop, and told them to attach little bells to the horses' breastplates. Cortez also mounted his horse and said, it would be well if we could gallop on these sand dunes, but they will observe that even when on foot we get stuck in the sand. Let us go out to the beach when the tide is low and gallop two and two. And to Pedro de Alvarado, whose sorrel-colored mare was a great galloper and very handy, he gave charge of all the horsemen. All this was carried out in the presence of the two ambassadors, and so that they should see the cannon fired, Cortez made as though he wished again to speak to them, and a number of other chieftains, and the Lombards were fired off. And as it was quite still at that moment, the stones went flying through the forest resounding with a great din, and the two governors and all the other Indians were frightened by things so new to them, and ordered the painters to record them so that Montezuma might see. It happened that one of the soldiers had a helmet half gilt but somewhat rusty, and this Tendile noticed, for he was the more forward of the two ambassadors, and said that he wished to see it as it was like one that they possessed which had been left to them by their ancestors of the race, from which they had sprung, and that it had been placed on the head of their god, Huichilobos, and that their prince Montezuma would like to see this helmet. So it was given to him, and Cortez said to them that as he wished to know whether the gold of this country was the same as that we find in our rivers, they could return the helmet filled with grains of gold, so that he could send it to our great emperor. After this, Tendile bade farewell to Cortez, and to all of us, and after many expressions of regard from Cortez, he took leave of him, and said he would return with a reply without delay. After Tendile had departed, we found out that besides being an Indian employed in matters of great importance, Tendile was the most active of the servants whom his master Montezuma had in his employ. And he went with all haste and narrated everything to his prince, and showed him the pictures which had been painted and the present which Cortez had sent. When the great Montezuma gazed on it, he was struck with admiration and received it on his part with satisfaction. When he examined the helmet and that which was on his Huichilobos, he felt convinced that we belonged to the race which, as his forefathers had foretold, would come to rule over that land. When Tendile departed, the other governor, Pitopitog, stayed in our camp and occupied some huts a little distance from ours, and they brought Indian women there to make maize bread, and brought fowls and fruit and fish, and supplied Cortez and the captains who fed with him. As for us soldiers, if we did not hunt for shellfish on the beach or go out fishing, we did not get anything. About that time, many Indians came from the towns, and some of them brought gold and jewels of little value, and fowls to exchange with us for our goods, which 
consisted of green beads and clear glass beads and other articles, and with this we managed to supply ourselves with food. Almost all the soldiers had brought things for barter, as we learned in Grialva's time that it was a good thing to bring beads, and in this manner six or seven days passed by. Then one morning Tendile arrived with more than one hundred laden Indians, accompanied by a great Mexican cacique, who in his face, features, and appearance bore strong likeness to our Captain Cortez, and the great Montezuma had sent him purposely, for it is said that when Tendile brought the portrait of Cortez, all the chiefs were in Montezuma's company said that a great chief named Quintalbor looked exactly like Cortez, and that was the name of the cacique who now arrived with Tendile. And as he was so like Cortez, we called them in camp our Cortez and the other Cortez. To get back to my story, when these people arrived and came before our captain, they first of all kissed the earth and then fumigated him, and all the soldiers were standing around him with incense, which they brought in braziers of pottery. Cortez received them affectionately, and seated them near himself, and that chief who came with the present had been appointed spokesman together with Tendile. After welcoming us to the country, and after many courteous speeches had passed, he ordered the presents which he had brought to be displayed, and they were placed on mats over which were spread cotton cloths. The first article presented was a wheel like a sun, as big as a cartwheel with many sorts of pictures on it, the whole of fine gold, and a wonderful thing to behold, which those who afterwards weighed it said was worth more than ten thousand dollars. Then another wheel was presented of greater size, made of silver, of great brilliancy in imitation of the moon, with other figures shown on it. And this was of great value, as it was very heavy, and the chief brought back the helmet full of fine grains of gold, just as they are got out of the mines, and this was worth three thousand dollars. This gold in the helmet was worth more to us if it had contained twenty thousand dollars, because it showed us that there were good mines there. Then were brought twenty golden ducks, beautifully worked and very natural looking, and some ornaments like dogs, and many articles of gold worked in the shape of tigers and lions and monkeys, and ten collars beautifully worked, and other necklaces, and twelve arrows and a bow with a string, and two rods like staves of justice, five palms long, all in beautiful hollow work of fine gold. Then there were presented crests of gold and plumes of rich green feathers, and others of silver and fans of the same materials, and deer copied in hollow gold, and many other things that I cannot remember, for it all happened so many years ago. And then over thirty loads of beautiful cotton cloth were brought worked with many patterns, and decorated with many colored feathers, and so many other things were that it is useless for my trying to describe them, for I know not how to do it. When all these things had been presented, this great cacique, Quintalbor, and Tendile asked Cortez to accept this present with the same willingness with which his prince had sent it, and to divide it among the Teules, and the men who accompanied him. Cortez received the present with delight, and then the ambassadors told Cortez that they wished to repeat what their prince Montezuma had sent them to say. First of all, they told him that he was pleased that such valiant men, as he had heard that they were, should come to his country, for he knew all about what we had done at Tabasco, and that he would much like to see our great emperor, who was such a mighty prince, and whose fame was spread over so many lands, and that he would send him a present of precious stones, and that meanwhile we should stay in that port, that, if he could assist us in any way, he would do so with the greatest pleasure, but as to the interview, they should not worry about it, that there was no need for it, and they, the ambassadors, urged many objections. Cortez kept a good countenance and returned his thanks to them, and with many flattering expressions gave each of the ambassadors two holland shirts and some blue glass beads and other things, and begged them to go back as his ambassadors to Mexico, and to tell their prince, the great Montezuma, that as we had come across so many seas, and had journeyed from such distant lands solely to see and speak with him in person, that if we should return thus, that our great king and lord would not receive us well, and that wherever their prince Montezuma might be, we wished to go and see him, and do what he might order us to do. 
The ambassadors replied that they would go back and give this message to their prince, but as to the question of the desired interview, they considered it superfluous. By these ambassadors, Cortez sent what our poverty could afford as a gift to Montezuma, a glass cup of Florentine ware, engraved with trees and hunting scenes and gilt, and three Holland shirts and other things, and he charged the messengers to bring a reply. The two governors set out, and Pitopitoc remained in camp, for it seems that the other servants of Montezuma had given him orders to see that food was brought to us from the neighboring towns. As soon as the messengers had been sent off to Mexico, Cortes dispatched two ships to explore the coast further along, and to seek out a safe harbor, and search for lands where we could settle, for it was clear that we could not settle on those sand dunes, both on account of the mosquitoes and the distance from other towns. They did as they were told, and arrived at the Rio Grande, which is close to Panuco. They were not able to proceed any further on account of the strong currents. Seeing how difficult the navigation had become, they turned round and made for San Juan de Ulua, without having made any further progress. I must now go back to say that the Indian Pitopitoc, who remained behind to look after the food, slackened his efforts to such an extent that no provisions reached the camp, and we were greatly in need of food, for the cassava turned sour from the damp and rotted and became foul with weevils, and if we had not gone hunting for shellfish, we should have had nothing to eat. The Indians, who used to come bringing gold and fowls for barter, did not come in such numbers as on our first arrival, and those who did come were very shy and cautious, and we began to count the hours that must elapse before the return of the messengers who had gone to Mexico. We were thus waiting when Tendile returned, accompanied by many Indians, and after having paid their respects in the usual manner by fumigating Cortez and the rest of us with incense, he presented ten loads of fine, rich feather cloth and four chalkiwites, which are green stones of very great value, and held in the greatest esteem among the Indians, more than emeralds are by us, and certain other gold articles. Not counting the chalkiwites, the gold alone was said to be worth three thousand dollars. Then Tendile and Pitalpitoc went aside with Cortez and Doña Marina and Aguilar, and reported that their prince Montezuma had accepted the present, and was greatly pleased with it, but as to an interview, that no more should be said about it, that these rich stones of Chalcuite should be sent to the great emperor as they were of the highest value, each one being worth more and being esteemed more highly than a great load of gold, and that it was not worth while to send any more messengers to Mexico. Cortes thanked the messengers and gave them presents, but it was certainly a disappointment to him to be told so distinctly that we could not see Montezuma and he said to some soldiers who happened to be standing near, Surely this must be a great and rich prince, and some day, please God, we must go and see him. And the soldiers answered, We wish that we were already living with him. Let us now leave this question of visits, and relate that it was now the time of the Ave Maria, and at the sound of a bell which we had in the camp, we all fell on our knees before a cross placed on a sand hill, and said our prayers of the Ave Maria before the cross. When Tendile and Pitalpitoc saw us thus kneeling, as they were very intelligent, they asked what was the reason that we humbled ourselves before a tree cut in that particular way. As Cortez heard this remark, he said to the Padre de la Marcet, who was present, It is a good opportunity, Father, as we have good material at hand, to explain through our interpreters matters touching our holy faith and then he delivered a discourse to the cacique so fitting to the occasion that no good theologian could have bettered it. Cortez said many things very well expressed, which they thoroughly understood, and they replied that they would report them to their prince Montezuma. Cortez also told them that one of the objects for which our great emperor had sent us to their countries was to abolish human sacrifices and the other evil rites which they practiced, and to see that they did not rob one another or worship those cursed images, and Cortez prayed them to set up in their city in the temples where they kept the idols which they believed to be gods, a cross like the one they saw before them, and to set up in the same place an image of Our Lady, which he would give them, with her precious son in her arms, and they would see how well it would go with them, and what our God would do for them, 
I recall to mind that on this latest visit many Indians came with Indiele, who were wishing to barter articles of gold, which, however, were of no great value. So all the soldiers set about bartering, and the gold which we gained by this barter we gave to the sailors who were out fishing in exchange for their fish, so as to get something to eat. For otherwise, we often underwent great privations through hunger. Cortez was pleased at this, although he pretended not to see what was going on. When the friends of Diego Velasquez saw that some of us soldiers were bartering for gold, they asked Cortez why he permitted it, and said that Diego Velasquez did not send out the expedition in order that the soldiers should carry off most of the gold, and that it would be as well to issue an order that for the future no gold should be bartered for by anyone but Cortez himself, and that all the gold already obtained should be displayed so that the royal fifth might be taken from it, and that some suitable person should be placed in charge of the treasury. To all this, Cortez replied that all they said was good, and that they themselves should name that person, and they chose Gonzalo Mejia. When this had been done, Cortez turned to them with angry mien and said, Observe, gentlemen, that our companions are suffering great hardships from want of food, and it is for this reason that we ought to overlook things, so that they may all find something to eat. All the more so as the amount of gold they bargain for is but a trifle, and God willing, we are willing to obtain a large amount of it. However, there are two sides to everything. The order has been issued that bartering for gold shall cease, as you desired. We shall see next what we will get to eat. I will go on to relate how one morning we woke up to find not a single Indian in any of their huts, neither those who used to bring the food nor those who came to trade, nor Pitalpitok himself. They had all fled without saying a word. The cause of this, as we afterwards learned, was that Montezuma had sent orders to avoid further conversation with Cortez and those in his company. For it appears that Montezuma was very much devoted to his idols, named Teshkatepuka, and Huichilobos, the latter the god of war, and Teshkatepuka, the god of hell, and daily he sacrificed youths to them so as to get an answer from the gods as to what he should do about us, for Montezuma had already formed a plan. If we did not go off in the ships to get us all into his power and to raise a breed of us and also to keep us for sacrifice, as we afterwards found out, the reply given by the gods was that he should not listen to Cortez, nor to the message which we sent about setting up a cross in an image of Our Lady, and that such things should not be brought to the city. This was the reason why the Indians left our camp without warning. When we heard the news, we thought that they meant to make war on us, and we were very much on the alert. One day, as I and another soldier were stationed on some sand dunes keeping a lookout, we saw five Indians coming along the beach. And so as not to raise a scare in camp over so small a matter, we permitted them to approach. When they came up to us with smiling countenances, they paid us homage according to their custom and made signs that we should take them into camp. I told my companions to remain where he was, and I would accompany the Indians, for at that time my feet were not as heavy as they are now that I am old. And when we came before Cortez, the Indians paid him every mark of respect and said, Lo Penusio. Lo Pelusio, which in the Totonac language means Prince and Great Lord. These men had large holes in their lower lips, some with stone discs in them spotted with blue, and others with thin leaves of gold. They also had their ears pierced with large holes in which they placed discs of stone or gold, and in their dress and speech they differed greatly from the Mexicans who had been staying with us. When Doña Marina and Aguilar, the interpreters, heard the words Lope Lucio, they did not understand it, and Doña Marina asked in Mexican if there were not among them Nahuatatos, that is, interpreters of the Mexican language, and two of the five answered yes, that they understood and spoke it, and they bade us welcome and said that their chief had sent them to ask who we might be and that it would please him to be of service to such valiant men, for it appeared that they knew about our doings at Tabasco and Champoton, and they added that they would have come to see us before, but for fear of the people of Kulua who had been with us, by Kulua the men Mexicans, and that they knew that three days ago they had fled back to their own country, and in the course of their talk Cortes found out that Montezuma had opponents and enemies, 
which he was delighted to hear. And after flattering these five messengers and giving them presents, he bade them farewell, asking them to tell their chief that he would very soon come and pay them a visit. From this time on, we called those Indians Lopelucios. I must leave them now and go on to say that into those sand dunes where we were camped, there were always many mosquitoes, both long-legged ones and small ones, which are called jejenes, which are worse than the large ones, and we could get no sleep on account of them. We were very short of food, and the cassava bread was disappearing, and what there was of it was very damp and foul with weevils. Some of the soldiers who possessed Indians in the island of Cuba were continually sighing for their homes, especially the friends and servants of Diego Velasquez. When Cortez noted the state of affairs and the wishes of these men, he gave orders that we should go to the fortified town which had been seen by Montejo and the pilot Alaminos, named Cuyahuitlan, where the ships would be under the protection of the rock which I have mentioned. When arrangements were being made for us to start, all the friends, relations, and servants of Diego Velasquez asked Cortez why he wanted to make that journey without having any provisions, seeing that there was no possibility of going on any further, and that over thirty-five soldiers had already died in camp from wounds inflicted at Tabasco, and from sickness and hunger, that the country we were in was a great one, and the settlements very thickly populated, and that any day they might make war on us, that it would be much better to return to Cuba, and amount to Diego Velasquez for the gold gained in barter, which had already amounted to a large sum, and the great presents from Montezuma, the sun and the silver moon, and the helmet full of golden grains from the mines, and all the cloths and jewels already mentioned by me. Cortez replied to them that it was all not good advice to recommend our going back without reason, that hitherto we could not complain of our fortune, and should give thanks to God who was helping us in everything. And as for those who had died, that that always happened in wars and under hardships, that it would be well to find out what the country contained, that meanwhile we could eat the maize and other food held by the Indians, and by the neighboring towns, unless our hands had lost their cunning. With this reply, the partisans of Diego Velasquez were somewhat, but not wholly appeased, for there were already cliques formed in camp to discuss the return to Cuba. It appears that Cortez had already talked the matter over with Alonso Hernandez, Puerto Carrero, and Pedro de Alvarado, and his four brothers Jorge, Gonzalo, Gomez, and Juan, and with Cristobal de Olid, Alonso de Avila, Juan de Escalante, Francisco de Lugo, and with me and other gentlemen and captains, and suggested that we should beg of him to be our captain. Francisco de Montejo understood what was going on, and was on the watch. One night after midnight, Alonso Hernandez Puerto Carrero, Juan de Escalante, and Francisco de Lugo came to my hut. Francisco de Lugo and I came from the same country, and were distant kinsmen. They said to me, Señor Bernal Diaz, come out with your arms and go the rounds. We will accompany Cortes, who is just now going the rounds. When I was a little distance from the hut, they said to me, Look to it, sir, that you keep secret for a time what we wish to tell you, for it is a matter of importance, and see that your companions in your hut know nothing of it, for they are of the party of Diego Velasquez. What they said to me was, Sir, does it seem to you to be right that Hernando Cortez should have deceived us all in bringing us here, he having proclaimed in Cuba that he was coming to settle it? Now we find out that he has no power to do so but only to trade and they want us to return to Santiago de Cuba with all the gold that has been collected, and we shall lose our all, for will not Diego Velasquez take all the gold as he did before? Now look, sir, counting this present expedition, you have already come to this country three times, spending your own property and contracting debts, and risking your life many times with the wounds you have received. Many of us gentlemen who know that we are your honor's friends wish you to understand that this must not go on, that this land must be settled in the name of his majesty, and by Hernando Cortez in his majesty's name, while we await the opportunity to make it known to our lord the king in Spain. Be sure, sir, to cast your vote so that all of us unanimously and willingly choose him, captain, for it will be a service to God and our lord the king. I replied that it was not a wise decision to return to Cuba, and that it would be a good thing for the country to be settled. 
and we should choose Cortez as general and chief justice until his majesty should order otherwise. This agreement passed from soldier to soldier, and the friends and relations of Diego Velasquez, who were more numerous than we were, got to know of it, and with overbold words asked Cortez why he was craftily arranging to remain in this country instead of returning to render an account of his doings to the man who had sent him as captain. And they told him that Diego Velasquez would not approve of it, and that the sooner we embarked, the better. And there was no use in his subterfuges and secret meetings with the soldiers, for we had neither supplies nor men, nor any possibility of founding a settlement. Cortez answered, without a sign of anger, and said that he agreed with them, that he would not go against the instructions and notes which he had received from Diego Velasquez, and he issued an order for us all to embark on the following day, each one in the ship in which he had come. We who had made the agreement answered that it was not fair to deceive us so, that in Cuba he had proclaimed that he was coming to make a settlement, whereas he had only come to trade, and we demanded on behalf of our Lord God and of His Majesty that he should at once form a settlement and give up any other plan, because that would be of the greatest benefit and service to God and the King, and they placed many other well-reasoned arguments before him, saying that the natives would never let us land again as they had done this time, and that as soon as a settlement was made in the country, soldiers would gather in from all the islands to give us help, and that Velasquez had ruined us all by stating publicly that he had received a decree from his majesty to form a settlement, the contrary being the case, that he wished to form a settlement and to let those depart who desired to return to Cuba. So, so Cortez agreed to it, although he pretended to need much begging, as the saying goes, you are very pressing, and I want to do it. And he stipulated that we should make him chief justice and captain general. And the worst of all that we conceded was that we should give him a fifth of all the gold which should be obtained, after the royal fifth had been deducted. And then we gave him the very fullest powers in the presence of the king's notary, Diego de Godoy, embracing all that I have here stated. We at once set to work to found and settle a town which was called the Via Rica de la Veracruz, because we arrived on Thursday of the Last Supper and landed on Holy Friday of the Cross, and rich because of what that gentleman said who approached Cortez and said to him, Behold, rich lands, may you know how to govern them well. And what he wanted to say was, May you remain as their captain general. And that gentleman was Alonso Hernandez Puerto Correro. To go back to my story, as soon as the town was founded, we appointed alcaldes and regidores. The former were Alonso Hernandez Puerto Correro and Francisco Montejo. In the case of Montejo, it was because he was not on very good terms with Cortez that Cortez ordered him to be named as alcalde, so as to place him in the highest position. I need not give the names of the regidores, for it is no use naming only a few of them. But I must mention the fact that a pillory was placed in the plaza and a gallows set up outside the town. We chose Pedro de Alvarado as captain of expeditions, and Cristobal de Olid as maestro de campo. Juan de Escalante was chosen chief alguacil, Gonzalo Mejia, treasurer, and Alonso de Avia, accountant. A certain corral was named as ensign, because Villaroel, who had been ensign, was dismissed from the post on account of some offense he had given Cortez about an Indian woman from Cuba. Ochoa, a Biscayan, and Alonso Romero were appointed alguaciles of the camp. It will be said that I have made no mention of the Captain Gonzalo de Sandoval. I say this was because at that time he was a youth, and we did not take such count of him and of other valiant captains until we saw him grow in worth in such a way that Cortez and all the soldiers held him in the same esteem as Cortez himself, as I shall tell later on. When the partisans of Diego Velasquez realized the fact that we had chosen Cortez for our captain and chief justice, and had founded a town, and chosen alcaldes and regidores, and had done all that I have narrated, they were angry and furious, and they began to excite factions and meetings, and to use abusive language about Cortez, and those of us who had elected him, saying that it was not right to do these things unless all the captains and soldiers who had come on the expedition had been parties to it, that Diego Velasquez had given Cortez no such powers, only authority to trade, and that we partisans of Cortez should take care that our insolence did not so increase 
as to bring us to blows. Then Cortez secretly told Juan de Escalante that we should make him produce the instructions given him by Diego Velasquez. Upon this, Cortez drew them from his bosom and gave them to the king's scribe to read aloud. In these instructions were the words, As soon as you have gained all you can by trading, you will return. And the document was signed by Diego Velasquez and countersigned by his secretary, André de Duero. We begged Cortez to cause this document to be attached to the deed recording the power we had given him, as well as the proclamation which he issued in the island of Cuba. And this was done so that His Majesty in Spain should know that all that we did was done in his royal service, and that they should not bring against us anything but the truth. After this was done, these same friends and dependents of Diego Velasquez returned to Cortez to say that they did not wish to remain under his command, but to return at once to the island of Cuba. Cortez replied that he would detain no one by force, and that to anyone who came to ask to leave to return he would willingly grant it, even although we were left alone. With this some of them were quieted, but not Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Orda and Escobar and other friends of Diego Velasquez, and it came to this, that they refused all obedience to Cortez. With our assistance, Cortez determined to make prisoners of Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Orda and Escobar and Pedro Escadero, and we took care that the others should create no disturbance. These men remained prisoners for some days, in chains and under guard. When all that I have related had been settled and done with, it was arranged that Pedro de Alvarado should go inland to some towns, which we had been told were nearby, and see what the country was like, and bring back maize and some sort of supplies, for there was a great want of food in camp. Alvarado took one hundred soldiers with him, among them fifteen crossbowmen and six musketeers. More than half his soldiers were partisans of Diego Velasquez. All Cortez's party remained with him for fear that there should be any further disturbance or tricks played or any rioting against him until things became more settled. Alvarado went first to some small town subject to another town called Cotashtla, where the language of Kulua was spoken. This name, Kulua, means the common language of Mexico. When Pedro de Alvarado reached the old towns, he found that they had all been deserted that same day, and he found in the queues bodies of men and boys who had been sacrificed, and the walls and altars stained with blood, and the hearts placed as offerings before the idols. He also found the stones on which the sacrifices were made, and the stone knives with which to open the chest so as to take out the heart. Pedro de Alvarado said that he found most of the bodies without arms or legs, and that he was told by some Indians that they had been carried off to be eaten, and our soldiers were astounded at such cruelty. I will not say any more of the number of sacrifices, although we found the same thing in every town we afterwards entered. Alvarado found the towns well provisioned, but deserted that very day, and by their inhabitants, so that he could not find more than two Indians to carry maize, and each soldier had to load himself with poultry and vegetables, and he returned to camp without doing any other damage, although he had good opportunity for doing it, because Cortez had given orders to that effect, so that there should be no repetition of what happened in Cozumel. We were pleased enough in camp, even with the little food that had been brought, for all the evils and hardships disappear when there is plenty to eat. And to go back to my story... As Cortez was most energetic in every direction, he managed to make friends with the partisans of Diego Velasquez, for with that solvent of hardness, presents of gold from our store to some, and promises to others, he brought them over to his side, and took them out of prison, all except Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Arda, who were in irons on board ship. These two he let out of prison after a few days, and made good and true friends of them, as will be seen further on and all through gold, which is such a pacifier. When everything had been settled, we arranged to go to the fortified town already mentioned by me, which was called Quiwishlan. The ships were to go to the rock and harbor, which was opposite that town, about a league distant from it. I remember that as we marched along the coast, we killed a large fish, which had been thrown up high and dry by the sea. When we arrived at the river where Veracruz is now situated, we found the water to be deep, 
and we crossed over it in some broken canoes like troughs, and others crossed by swimming or on rafts. Then we came on some town subject to the large town named Sempuala, whence came the five Indians with the golden librettes, who came as messengers to Cortez as at the sand dunes. We found some idle houses and places of sacrifice, and blood splashed about, and incense used for fumigation, and other things belonging to the idols, and stones with which they made the sacrifices, and parrots feathers, and many paper books doubled together in folds like Spanish cloth. But we found no Indians, they having already fled, for as they had never before seen men like us, nor horses, they were afraid. We slept there that night, and we went without supper, and next day, leaving the coast, we continued our march inland towards the west, without knowing the road we were taking. And we came on some good meadows called savannas, where deer were grazing, and Pedro de Alvarado rode after one at his sorrel mare, and struck at it with his lance, and wounded it, but it got away into the woods, and could not be caught. While this was happening, we saw twelve Indians approaching, inhabitants of the farms where we had passed the night. They came straight from their cacique, and brought fowls and maize cakes, and they said to Cortez through our interpreters that their chief had sent the fowls for us to eat, and begged us to come to his town, which was, according to the signs they made, distant one sun's, that is, one day's, march. Cortez thanked them, and made much of them, and we continued our search, and slept in another small town, where also many sacrifices had been made, but as many readers will be tired of hearing the great numbers of Indian men and women whom we found sacrificed in all the towns and roads we passed, I shall go on with my story without stopping to say any more about them. They gave us supper at the little town, and we learnt that the road to Quahuitlan, which I have already said is a fortress, passed by Sempuala. We slept at the little town where the twelve Indians I have mentioned had prepared quarters for us, and after being well informed about the road with which we had to take to reach the town on the hill, very early in the morning we sent word to the caciques of Sempuala that we were coming to their town and that we hoped they would approve. Cortez sent six of the Indians with this message and kept the other six as guides. He also ordered the guns, muskets, and crossbows to be kept ready for use and sent scouts on ahead on the lookout. And horsemen and all the rest of us were kept on the alert and in this way we marched to within a league of the town. As we approached, twenty Indian chieftains came out to receive us in the name of the cacique, and brought some cones made of the roses of the country with a delicious scent, which they gave to Cortez, and those on horseback with every sign of friendliness, and they told Cortez that their lord was waiting us at our apartments, for as he was a very stout and heavy man, he could not come out to receive us himself. Cortez thanked them, and we continued our march, and as we got among the houses and saw what a large town it was, larger than any we had yet seen, we were struck with admiration. It looked like a garden with luxuriant vegetation, and the streets were so full of men and women who had come to see us that we gave thanks to God at having discovered such a country. Our scouts, who were on horseback, reached a great plaza with courts where they had prepared our quarters, and it seems that during the last few days they had been whitewashed and burnished, a thing they knew well how to do, and it seemed to one of the scouts that this white surface which shone so brightly must be silver, and he came back at full speed to tell Cortez that the walls of the houses were made of silver. Doña Marina and Aguila said that it must be plaster or lime, and... We had a good laugh for the man's silver excitement, and always afterwards we told him that everything white looked to him like silver. I will leave our jokes, and say that we reached the buildings, and the fat cacique came out to receive us in the court. He was so fat that I shall call him by this name, and he made deep obeisance to Cortez, and fumigated him, as is their custom, and Cortez embraced him, and we were lodged in fine and large apartments to tell us all, and they gave us food, and brought some baskets of plums, which were very plentiful at that season, and maize cakes, and as we arrived ravenous and had not seen so much food for a long time, we called the town Via Viciosa. Cortez gave orders that none of the soldiers should leave the plaza, and that on no account should they give any offense to the Indians. When the fat cacique heard that we had finished eating, he sent to tell Cortez that he wished to come and visit him, 
and he came in company with a great number of Indian chieftains, all wearing a large gold libret and rich mantles. Cortez left his quarters to go out and meet them, and embraced the cacique with great show of caressing and flattery, and the fat cacique ordered a present to be brought, which he had prepared, consisting of gold, jewels, and cloths. But although it did not amount to much, and was of little value, he said to Cortez, Lo Pelusio, Lo Pelusio, accept this in good part. If I had more, I would give it to you. Cortez replied that, through Doña Marina and Aguilar that he would pay for the gift in good works, and that if the cacique would tell him what he wanted to be done, that he would do it. For we were the vassals of a great prince, the Emperor Don Carlos, who had sent us to redress grievances and punish evil doers, and to put an end to human sacrifices. And he explained to them that many things touching our holy religion. When the fat cacique heard this, he sighed and complained bitterly of the great Montezuma and his governors, saying that he had recently been brought under his yoke, that all his golden jewels had been carried off, and he and his people were so grievously oppressed that they dared do nothing without Montezuma's orders, for he was a lord over many cities and countries, and ruled over countless vassals and armies of warriors. As Cortez knew that he could not attend at that time to the complaints which they made, he replied that he would see to it that they were relieved of their burdens, that he was now on the way to visit his alcales, for so they call the ships in the Indian language, and take up his residence and make his headquarters in the town of Quiwitzlam, and that as soon as he was settled there, he would consider the matter more thoroughly. To this the fat cacique replied that he was quite satisfied that it should be so. The next morning we left Sempuala, and there were awaiting our orders over four hundred Indian carriers, who carry fifty pounds weights on their backs, and march five leagues with it. When we saw so many Indians to carry burdens, we rejoiced, as before this those of us who had not brought Indians with us from Cuba had to carry knapsacks on our own backs, and only six or seven Cubans had been brought on the fleet. Doña Marina and Aguilar told us that at these parts, in times of peace, the caciques are bound to furnish Tamines to carry burdens as a matter of course, and from this time forward, whenever we went, we asked for Indians to carry loads. Cortez took leave of the fat cacique, and on the following day we set out on our march and slept at a little town which had been deserted near to Quiwitzlan, and the people of Sempoala brought us food. The next day, about ten o'clock, we reached the fortified town, which stands amid great rocks and lofty cliffs, and if there had been any resistance, it would have been very difficult to capture it. Expecting that there would be fighting, we kept a good formation with the artillery in front, and marched up to the fortress in such a manner that, if anything had happened, we could have done our duty. We went halfway through the town, without meeting a single Indian to speak to, at which we were very much surprised, for they had fled in fear that very day when they had seen us climbing up to their houses. When we had reached the top of the fortress in the plaza nearby, where they and had their queues in great idle houses, we saw fifteen Indians awaiting us, all clad in good mantles, and each one with a brazier in his hand containing incense, and they came to where Cortez was standing, and fumigated him, and all the soldiers who were standing near, and with deep obeisances, they asked pardon for not coming out to meet us, and assured us that we were welcome, and asked us to rest. And they said that they had fled, and kept out of the way, until they could see what sort of things we were, for they were afraid of us, and of our horses, but that night they would order all the people to come back to the town. Cortez displayed much friendship toward them, and they gave them some green beads and other trifles from Spain, and they brought fowls and maize cakes. While we were talking, someone came to tell Cortez that the fat cacique from Sempoala was coming in a litter, carried on the shoulders of many Indian chieftains. When the fat cacique arrived, he together with the cacique and chiefs of the town, dressed Cortez, relating their many causes of complaint against Montezuma, and telling him of his great power. And this they did with such signs and tears that Cortez and those who were standing with him were moved to pity. Besides relating the way that they had been brought into subjection, they told us that every year many of their sons and daughters were demanded of them for sacrifice, and others for service in the houses and plantations of their conquerors, 
and they made other complaints which were so numerous that I do not remember them all, but they said that Montezuma's tax gatherers carried off their wives and daughters, if they were handsome, and ravished them, and this they did throughout the land where the Totonac language was spoken, which contained over thirty towns. Cortez consoled them as well as he was able through our interpreters, and said he would help them all he could, and would prevent these robberies and offenses, as it was for that our lord the emperor had sent us to these parts, and that they should have no anxiety, for they would soon see what we would do in the matter, and they seemed to gather some satisfaction from this assurance, but their hearts were not eased on account of the great fear they had of the Mexicans. While this conversation was going on, some Indians from the town came in great haste to tell the caciques who were talking to Cortez that five Mexicans, who were Montezuma's tax gatherers, had just arrived. When they heard the news, they turned pale and trembled with fear, and leaving Cortez alone, they went off to receive the Mexicans, and in the shortest possible time they had decked a room with flowers, and had food cooked for the Mexicans to eat, and prepared plenty of cacao, which is the best thing they have to drink. When these five Indians entered the town, they came to the place where we were assembled, where were the houses of the cacique and our quarters, and approaching us with the utmost assurance and arrogance, without speaking to Cortez or to any of us, they passed us by. Their cloaks and loincloths were richly embroidered, and their shining hair was gathered up as though tied on their heads, and each one was smelling the roses that he carried, and each had a crooked staff in his hand. Their Indian servants carried fly whisks, and they were accompanied by many of the chief men of the other Totonac towns, who until they had shown them to their lodgings and brought them food of the best, never left them. As soon as they had dined, they sent to summon the fat cacique and the other chiefs, and scolded them for entertaining us in their houses, for now they would have to speak and deal with us, which would not please their lord Montezuma. For without his permission and orders they should not have sheltered us, nor given us presents of gold and jewels. And on this subject they uttered many threats against the fat cacique and the other chiefs, and ordered them at once to provide twenty Indians, men and women, to appease their gods for the wrong that had been done. When he saw what was going on, Cortez asked our interpreters, Doña Marina and Jeronimo de Aguila, why the caciques were so agitated since the arrival of those Indians, and who they were. Doña Marina, who understood full well what had happened, told him what was going on, and then Cortez summoned the fat cacique and the other chiefs, and asked them who these Indians were, and why they made such a fuss about them. They replied that they were the tax-gatherers of the great Montezuma, and that they had come to inquire why they had received us in their town without the permission of their lord, and that they now demanded twenty men and women to sacrifice to their god, Huichilobos, so that he would give them victory over us. For they, the tax-gatherers, said the Montezuma had declared that he intended to capture and make slaves of us. Cortes reassured them, and bade them have no fear, for he was here with all of us in his company, and that he would chastise the tax-gatherers 